submit a slate of nominees to be published 30 days in advance of the membership vote, and that membership vote for the new officers and board directors will take place at our annual meeting on May 31st. Suggestions or nominations for nominees, uh, if you have them to offer, should be sent to the nominations committee, care of the city club office, by this following Monday, March 18th. The leadership training course called Pathway to Leadership, introduced by City Club last fall, is going to be offered again beginning on March 20th. And this will be our third series of classes in what has proved to be a very popular and well-received program. The course is based on a model developed by Stephen Covey, author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It provides participants the opportunity to develop their professional and personal management skills and to become effective leaders. That's really a lot of what City Club is all about, so this fits in beautifully with the, the mission of City Club. The course is offered in five sessions. It starts with a full day session on March 20th, continues with four half day sessions through May the 9th. Enrollment is limited to 21, and at this time, six slots still remain available. You'll find informational brochures and registration forms on the table that was near the entrance as you came in today. This course will be led by trainer Linda Langley, who heads her own management training and consultant firm. Enrollment is open to anyone. Those who wish to register, whether you're City Club members or not, and you, you are welcome if you're not a City Club member, or to learn more about the course, should contact the City Club's executive director, Nancy Hedin, at 228-7231 by Wednesday, March 13th. Merrillhurst College is offering a college credit course which involves very heavily City Club. It's called Discourses in Public Affairs, Issues and Answers. It's based on topics presented at City Club Friday programs, and this course will be offered beginning on April the 5th. City Club members and others are invited to register for the 10-week course through Merrillhurst College. The public affairs course is designed to help participants become more familiar with social, educational, and political issues facing the Portland metropolitan area and the nation, which is, again, what City Club does, too. Participants will attend issue-based discussions following each Friday program, usually in a, with uh, the uh, speaker also in attendance, and they'll study one issue in depth. The participants have the opportunity to engage in a dialogue with those Friday program speakers who are able to join the discussion, and course facilitators are Mike Burton, state, re state representative and assistant to the president at Merrillhurst, and John Sinclair, chairman of Merrillhurst College's Humanities Department. If you're interested, you can call Merrillhurst Student Services at 636-8141. Our board host today, sitting at the head table, is Pamela Lesh, member of the Board of Governors and General Manager for Regulator Regulatory Affairs at Portland General Corporation. As usual, the board host, Pamela, has the privilege of asking the first question of our speaker today. The second question will be asked from the floor by Linda Ecker, member of the Law and Public Safety Standing Committee. After that, we, as usual, open up the meeting to questions from City Club members in the audience. I emphasize members only may ask questions, and I anticipate we'll have a few pretty good questions today. Preference is given to questions from the microphone, which will be on the floor. Uh, written questions will be asked as time permits, and there are cards for written questions on your tables. Please hold them up after the speech so that staff can gather them and bring them up to the head table. Now for our speaker today. The Washington Park Reservoir sits perched somewhat precariously um, in about halfway up in Washington Park. And a few years ago, the City of Portland Water Bureau conducted a thorough and uh, I think uh, quite proper study to determine whether the reservoir would withstand the force of the maximum anticipated earthquake. They discovered it would not and measures were taken and the Washington Park Reservoir has been strengthened to uh, resist an earthquake of what was at the time believed to be the maximum possible intensity. This is rather important because if the Washington Park Reservoir should fail in a catastrophic earthquake, as I heard one Water Bureau uh, person say, surfs up on Southwest Jefferson Street. <laughs> but because of recent developments in the science of geology, notably plate tectonics, uh, it's come to light in the last few years that the West Coast, and including the Portland area, may be subject in the foreseeable future to a subduction earthquake which would be huge. There are policy and fiscal implications without end for the aftermath of such an earthquake or for preparation for such an earthquake. 
But like nuclear winter or asteroid impacts, is this just something that's fun to talk about and scare people with? Or is it a real, verifiable threat that's worth spending resources, both public and private, and worth employing people on resources that might otherwise go to facing other social challenges? Our speaker today, Ian P. Maiden, is here to discuss those and other matters. He is the seismic hazard geologist for the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. He has held that position since it was created in 1987. Mr. Maiden has degrees from the University of California at Berkeley and Oregon State University, is a geologist who specializes in earthquakes, and I think has some uh, very interesting and revealing things to tell us today. I present to you Ian Maiden. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, I'm glad that uh, they uh, they gave you, <coughs> or they didn't give you the name to introduce me with it. I'm known by at the office, which is Doctor Doom, uh, <laughs> because an unfortunate amount of my uh, of my job uh, involves going around and scaring people. But um, if I do scare you today, I hope that I scare you with uh, a good reason and uh, have have a sound basis for terrifying you. So uh, be prepared to be terrified, but also to feel good about having been terrified when I get through. Uh, those of you that have lived in Oregon for any length of time, and perhaps even recent immigrants, probably uh, used to think that earthquakes were the price that Californians paid for eternal sunshine, and that earthquakes were something that we didn't have to worry about in Oregon at all. And until the mid-1980s, uh, that was the prevailing scientific consensus. Since about 1985, we have seen uh, a minor revolution in the uh, geologic understanding of earthquake processes in the Pacific Northwest and in Oregon. And it leads us uh, to some very scientifically elegant but personally uncomfortable conclusions. And I'm going to start out with the conclusions and then, uh, and then give you the details. The conclusions are, based on the best interpretation of the evidence, and there is a lot of circumstantial evidence, uh, Oregon and the Pacific Northwest have been impacted repeatedly by very large earthquakes. Uh, there is therefore very little doubt that a repeat of one of these earthquakes is inevitable. There is a growing body of information that suggests that a repeat is imminent. And there is little question that given the current state of pr preparation uh, in Portland and in all the other urban areas of the Willamette Valley, such an earthquake would cause uh, unprecedented damage and would be a, a catastrophe that had no parallel in Oregon's history. So if you accept all that on face value, uh, we can go straight to the questions. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're a little bit skeptical about it, then I owe you a detailed explanation of why we have come to this conclusion. Because as I said, this is a major shift from 1985 to 1991 to go from uh, a maximum earthquake threat of perhaps magnitude 5 to a maximum earthquake threat of perhaps magnitude 9. Because the way that those numbers work, so magnitude 9 is, I don't know, 27,000 times larger than a magnitude 5. It's a big difference. So uh, I'm going to lead you through uh, the process of scientific research and discovery that led us to this point and to try and simplify it so that it's, you can understand exactly why we are making these claims. Uh, the references to, uh, to nuclear winter and, and global warming are very uh, timely because like those issues, subduction zone earthquakes are something that we can't measure directly. We're working in time scales and, and distance scales that are really difficult for us to understand and perceive. And so we have to have an indirect understanding of these problems. If they did not have tremendous consequences, they would remain sort of academic uh, points of interest. But the potential consequences of a great earthquake are such that it immediately uh, if we sort of short circuit the normal scientific process and go straight to policy without going through 20 or 30 years of hard and, and cold proof. Before I start, um, I do need to do one thing, which is to, uh, in science, it's traditional, in fact, required to acknowledge the source of every piece of information that you use when you talk. And we have a limited amount of time. So I'm just going to start right off and, and tell you that the majority of the research that I'm discussing has not been personally performed by me. Uh, and I'm going to read you off the names of the researchers who are responsible for this information. And if I've left anybody out, well, that's, that's just the way it goes. Uh, very briefly, then, the information I'll be talking about comes from uh, researchers at the University of Oregon, Mark Richards, Paul Vincent, Ray Weldon, from Oregon State University, John Nabilik, Bob Yates, Chris Goldfinger, Vern Combe, 
from Portland State University, Ansel Johnson, Kurt Peterson, Mark Darienzo. From the U.S. Geological Survey, Tom Heaton, St Steve Herzl, Brian Atwater, Alan Nelson, Wendy Grant, Tom Yellen, Craig Weaver. From the University of Washington, Joanne Bourgeois, Mary Reinhardt, and Bob Crossan. From the Canadian Geological Survey, Gary Adams, uh, pardon me, Gary Rogers and John Adams. And from Humboldt State University, Gary Carver. So, as you can see, it's a fairly uh, large number of people involved, and they span the entire Pacific Northwest. Okay, on to the earthquakes. We have to start uh, in understanding this by stepping back and looking at the planet as a whole. And uh, the analogy that I'm going to use today is think of the Earth as a round watermelon. Okay, a watermelon is soft and pink and gooey on the inside. And to a large extent, the Earth is also soft and pink and gooey on the inside. That means that the rocks that make up the body of the Earth are relatively soft and uh, under the right conditions will flow sort of like molasses on a very, very, very cold day. The outer portion of the watermelon is a relatively hard green rind. The outer portion of the earth is a rigid rock shell that we call the crust. Now, because the interior body of the earth is relatively plastic and flows, that exterior rigid shell, the crust that we live on, is actually physically decoupled from the body of the earth and can move around with respect to the body of the earth. And it does so. And in the process of doing so, it breaks up into big pieces. These pieces of crust we call plates. And as the plates move, they bang into each other and scrape along the edges. And that is what is called plate tectonics. Tectonics simply means earth movements. So plate tectonics is the movement of these great big pieces of the crust that run into each other. That motion, that activity, is responsible for 99% of the earthquake and volcanic activity throughout the planet. In the Pacific Northwest, we deal with two major plates. One of them is the North American plate. It starts at the west coast of the United States, goes to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, to the North Pole, and the Caribbean. It is a very, very large piece of rock. Offshore, we have the Pacific plate, which goes from our coast to Japan, from Alaska to Antarctica. It is an even larger piece of rock. Okay? These two pieces of rock are moving every day with respect to each other at the rate of perhaps four inches a year. Now that motion, although continuous on long time scales, along the boundary between the two plates is discontinuous. The two plates stick together along their edges. And they, although the plates continue to move at four inches a year, the, the two sides will lock up and the rocks will bend. And when they can no longer tolerate that bending, they'll snap and form an earthquake. Well, the boundary between the Pacific and North American plate in California is the San Andreas Fault. And in 1989, we saw what happens when those two sides that have been stuck together release and slip. We had an earthquake. When you get into the Pacific Northwest, the situation becomes a little more complicated. That San Andreas Fault, which is heading north through California, remember it's the boundary between two huge masses of rock that are shifting. That boundary splits and outlines a small plate called the Juan de Fuca plate that lies off the coast of Oregon and Washington. This is sort of our own private little personal plate up here. Uh, it's about six or 800 miles long, two or 300 miles, perhaps 400 miles wide at the widest part. That small, relatively small piece of rock is moving away from the Pacific plate towards the North American plate at the rate of perhaps an inch and a half, almost two inches a year. When the Juan de Fuca plate encounters the North American plate, it's the classic irresistible force and immovable object. And the Juan de Fuca plate, because it's uh, smaller and more dense, when it butts, butts into the North American plate, actually physically dives beneath the edge of the North American continent and is driven beneath the North American plate into the body of the Earth. When it gets driven down far enough, it gets so hot that it melts, that molten material rises and forms volcanoes, like Mount St. Helens, like Mount Hood. This process we know is going on. It's possible to measure. Uh, earthquake activity all around the Juan de Fuca plate, and it's possible to see that we have active volcanoes here in the Pacific Northwest. We know that this plate is being stuffed underneath the edge of our continent. The fault along which that plate is being shoved underneath the edge of the continent is called the Cascadia subduction zone, and this is the feature that we are concerned with. Uh, it's like the San Andreas Fault in that it is a major boundary between two plates of the Earth's crust. San Andreas Fault, however, is a vertical structure, stands straight upright. The two pieces move one side past the other. 
The Cascadia subduction zone is tipped over on its side and one piece is sliding under the other. The Cascadia subduction zone then comes to the surface of the Earth offshore under a mile or two of water. It's very difficult to see. But if we could drill a hole 40 miles deep right beneath where we are standing, we would penetrate the Cascadia subduction zone. So we're sitting right on top of one of the largest active faults uh, known on the planet. Okay, uh, knowing this and knowing that almost every other subduction zone around the world of this type accomplishes its movement in periodic great earthquakes, the question is raised, why don't we have them? Why haven't we seen one? Well, in other subduction zones around the world, the time between great earthquakes may be on the order of hundreds of years. We have 150 years worth of recorded history in this area, so the fact that we haven't seen one gives us no reassurance. We are not, however, able to measure any earthquakes emanating from that Cascadia subduction zone fault with the most sensitive of modern equipment. Now, this has led seismologists to two conclusions. The first conclusion is that there's some sort of magic grease down there, uh, and our subduction zone, unlike most of those around the planet, moves continuously and smoothly. It somehow is lubricated, and it will never have an earthquake. Uh, the other half of the seismologists say, well, the reason that we don't have any earthquakes going on now is because two sides of the plates are locked together so incredibly tightly that not a single peep is getting out of them. Um, so we have one piece of evidence that argues both sides of the coin, and that's not a very satisfactory uh, situation, but it's really common in seismology, actually. Um, so the historic record doesn't do us any good. The instrumental, sensitive instrumental readings don't do us any good. What we have to do is look at the geologic record and look at the prehistoric record of potential great earthquakes that may have occurred in the Pacific Northwest. And the way we do this is by analogy. We look at other areas that have had great subduction earthquakes and try and see if they leave any kind of mark on the land that we might see in the geologic record. Well, we've had two phenomenal great subduction earthquakes in this century. In 1960, in southern Chile, there was a magnitude 9.6 earthquake, subduction earthquake, largest earthquake ever recorded. And in 1964, there was the Good Friday earthquake in Alaska, which was a magnitude 9.3 subduction zone earthquake, second largest earthquake ever recorded. And those two earthquakes left a very clear mark on the land. What happens during a subduction zone earthquake is that the two plates have been stuck together, locked up for hundreds of years. And while they have been locked up, the overriding plate has bent. This causes the land generally along the coast to rise imperceptibly at the rate of a millimeter or two a year for hundreds of years. When the earthquake occurs, that bending, that flexure is released, and the land appears to drop abruptly. And in Alaska and in Chile, the land along the coast for literally hundreds of miles subsided immediately, permanently, up to six or eight feet. So this is a big footprint. And we can go and look then in the Pacific Northwest to see if we can see a similar footprint. And the way that you look for that footprint is by going to a coastal marsh because as the land goes up and down with respect to the sea, the sea leaves a ring around the bathtub on the land in the form of characteristic bands of plant and animal and sediment deposits that form at certain elevations with respect to sea level. So that we know there are certain plants that do not tolerate having their feet washed by the tides. And then there are other plants that like to live in the tidal fluctuation zone. And then there are certain types of sediment and animals that live exclusively below the range of low tide. So that we can go out and look in marsh deposits and take a core or look in a cut in the marsh deposit and see if there's been a history of the land slowly rising and abruptly dropping. We do this by looking for buried marsh surfaces. The idea is that if the land is built up, has, has pushed up to a certain elevation, you can get a marsh surface developed that's completely above the range of tides. When the earthquake occurs, you suddenly submerge that marsh deposit and then over the years, you bury it with intertidal mud, and it slowly builds back up and forms another marsh deposit. So that's the theory. Well, in practice, uh, that was first discovered in southwest Washington, exactly that kind of deposit. Uh, and it was seen, actually, there were several of these buried marsh surfaces stacked one on top of the other. And subsequently, that research has been extended to Oregon. And there are now uh, 15 sites between the Coquille River and Seaside which have exactly this record. And at almost every one of those sites, there are numerous buried marsh surfaces. The site that has the most has something like 15 consecutive stacked marsh deposits, one on top of the other. 
When we see this kind of a signature of the land slowly rising and abruptly dropping, spread out over hundreds of miles of the Oregon and Washington coast, uh, we know that we are not looking at a small localized phenomenon. And the best explanation for what's causing that is a subduction zone earthquake, a great subduction earthquake, the movement of the plates. Now, that is the primary piece of evidence. That's sort of the smoking gun. We also, however, have corroborating evidence. It's possible to measure the rate at which the land is rising along the coast. Uh, this is done by comparing accurate highway leveling data. Uh, and we know that over the last 40, 70 years or so, parts of the Oregon coast have been rising at the rate of as much as two millimeters a year, other parts uh, at only one millimeter a year. But in any case, those are geologically astronomical rates. And we know that that kind of uplift rate cannot persist for any great length of time uh, without being balanced out by a rapid drop. We also have a record of uh, submarine landslides out in the deep ocean. These landslides can be dated, or the number of landslides can be dated by uh, looking at their relationship to the ash that was produced when Crater Lake erupted. And we can see that there are essentially exactly the same number of submarine landslides that have occurred everywhere from uh, about Bandon to someplace up in central Washington. Something is triggering these, earth or these landslides simultaneously. The only thing that we can think of that would do so over such a large area is a great earthquake. So all these pieces of evidence rolled in together uh, have only one answer, and that is a history of great earthquakes. We would like to find another answer, believe me, because I like living here. But uh, that's the best answer we can come up with. So the question that arises from that then is, uh, if we know that we've had a history of such earthquakes, when's the next one going to be so I can be out of town? And uh, a tremendous amount of effort is now going in to answering that question. The scientific debate over whether or not these earthquakes have occurred in the past is, has essentially uh, been completed, and there's a fair consensus that we are, in fact, looking at these earthquakes. The, the hot points of contention now are how often do they occur and how big are they going to be? So let's talk about how often they occur. The fundamental way that we date them is by radiocarbon dating of the detritus that's in these marsh deposits. There's plant material and old sticks and sometimes even trees that are rooted in the marsh deposits. You can get a radiocarbon date, and all up and down the coast this has been done. There's now hundreds of marsh surfaces that have been dated. The problem with radiocarbon dating it is, is that at best it has an error of maybe 100 or 200 years for events that are four or 500 years old. So it's very difficult then to compare two sites and say, well, they've got exact, you know, the, the, the marsh subsided on the very same afternoon. In fact, we can't even say it subsided on the very same decade, let alone the same century. But if we start to collect enough of these dates and treat them statistically, uh, we can begin to get some reasonable answers. One thing that we can measure more accurately is when the most recent event occurred because there are many sites where there are cedar trees that were rooted in these marshes that died when the marsh subsided because cedars don't tolerate salt on their roots. By comparing the tree ring patterns on those trees to tree ring patterns on their siblings that did not experience that event on higher slopes nearby, we can fix in several areas of southwestern Washington the date of the most recent event as 1687 sometime in the fall. So that's our most recent event, 300 years ago. The best estimate now, based on several sites at Seaside, Little Nestucca River, Alsea Bay, Neetarts Bay, is that the average time between earthquakes over the last 1,000 years or so has been 350 years, and the most recent one, 300 years ago. This is a point of concern. If we want to put this in terms of probabilities, and it's, uh, it's Probability calculations are sort of a weak attempt to try and put some sort of uh, certainty on a very uncertain thing. But the best estimate using the best data right now is that in the next 50 years, we have a 20% chance of experiencing one of these events. That means we have an 80% chance of not experiencing it. But 20% chance of experiencing a big earthquake is, is nothing to be sneezed at. The next question then is how big? And that's a really difficult question and uh, is quite uncertain. But by looking at the size of the subduction zone, earthquake, of the subduction zone, comparing it to other subduction zones around the world, pulling some numbers out of a hat and doing some theoretical calculations, uh, 
We don't think they can be very much smaller than magnitude 8, and we don't think they can be very much larger than magnitude 9. Uh, and that's not terribly reassuring. <laughs> okay, so now we're up to the point where we have a fair sense that we're, we've had these big earthquakes, that we're probably going to have another one, that it may actually occur during our lifetimes, and that if it does happen, it's going to be fairly big. The question now is, what does that mean for us here in Portland, in this building, or in any building here in Portland? There are three things that influence damage in earthquakes. One is, how big was the earthquake and where was it? Another is, what is the soil profile at the site? Because the effects of the site geology or the soil at the site uh, have very, very strong influence on the amount of damage. And the third part is, what's the building built to withstand? What kind of earthquake resistance does the building inherently have? OK, uh, we are starting from a premise then that we're looking at a magnitude 8 to 9 earthquake. Let's call it 8. Let's, be, let's give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Uh, located someplace offshore. Well, when we do calculations uh, to determine what kind of ground shaking that would produce, we find that uh, it would produce ground shaking a lot stronger than any we have ever seen in this area. Uh, and basically, it would be equivalent to sitting right on top of a magnitude 6.5 earthquake, which is not trivial by any means. When we look at the influence of soils on uh, damage in the Portland area, the things that we're worried about are relatively thick deposits of unconsolidated sand and silt and clay, particularly uh, sand and silt that are saturated with water because they tend to liquefy, lose their strength, and that causes spectacular damage like was, uh, we saw in the, the Marina District in San Francisco. Well, probably close to 75 or 80 percent of the Portland metropolitan area 70 percent, uh, is underlain by that, exactly that kind of soil. And uh, the entire Willamette River and Columbia River floodplain areas are underlain by material that has a fairly high uh, likelihood of liquefaction. So we've got a major strike against us there in terms of the kinds of soils. To illustrate to you how important the effects of soils are, 1985, the Mexico City earthquake was a subduction zone earthquake. Mexico City, which ex uh, experienced extensive structural d damage to modern, well-designed, well-constructed buildings, was something like 250 miles from the epicenter of that earthquake. The soils there amplified the ground shaking by up to 16 times. Uh, and we don't know if that can happen in Portland, but the opportunity is there. The materials are there that can, that can produce that kind of, uh, of effect. The other thing that we have to look at then is the buildings. What are they built to withstand? Currently, buildings in Oregon must conform to Uniform Building Code that was adopted in Oregon in 1974. And Uniform Building Code sets four earthquake zones of increasing degrees of earthquake resistance requirements. We are in Zone 2B. Uh, California, or most of uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, are in Zone 4. Seattle is in Zone 3. The uh, studies that we have done to date suggest that the smallest subduction zone earthquake that we can imagine will produce ground shaking in Portland that is at least zone three and possibly zone four. So uh, buildings that have been built in accordance with the building code since 1974 may be underdesigned. They may be substantially underdesigned. Before 1956, there was no earthquake design requirement for buildings in Portland. There were wind load requirements, which may have helped somewhat with small earthquakes. But we are looking at a population of older buildings, everything from the historic district buildings to a lot of the, uh, the multi-story commercial buildings uh, right in the heart of downtown Portland that have no designed-in earthquake resistance other than uh, that which they get by accident. So right now, we're faced with a situation where our buildings, our water and power distribution systems, transportation systems may be very, very significantly at risk from an earthquake that we now feel has a reasonable probability of occurring in our lifetime. And uh, that is obviously uh, a point of major concern. So the question is, what do we do about it? Well, the thing that I have to underscore is that we're looking at a 20% chance of this earthquake occurring in the next 50 years. That means we have an 80% chance of not having to deal with it in the next 50 years. So I'd like to take that as a sign that we have 50 years to get ready. And if we start now working on the things that we need to do, we may actually be ready by the time the earthquake rolls around. 
So what's the first thing we need to do? Well, we need to ensure that any building that we build from now on has reasonable resistance to this kind of earthquake designed into it. That's a relatively inexpensive thing to do. I'll give an example of that in a bit. When it comes to fixing the existing buildings, what has been found in community after community in California is that it is extremely expensive, it has social consequences that nobody ever thought about, and it's very hard politically to make it happen. So we're probably simply going to have to live with the risk of the existing buildings for the next 50 years and hope that normal attrition uh, tends to cycle those buildings out of the population. Uh, but we really are not going to get anywhere with that process unless we ensure that the buildings that are being added to the population are of greatly increased resistance. Uh, to give you an example of the problems associated with retrofit, fixing old buildings, uh, in California this has been mandated by several cities. The worst class of buildings for earthquake resistance is old unreinforced brick buildings. In San Francisco those tend to be inner city low income housing. Owners of those buildings who have to spend 50 or 100 percent of their value to bring them up to earthquake standards do not like to keep them as low income housing. They like to convert them to condos or some other high value uh, use. And so in an attempt to make the building safe you end up reducing your inner city low income housing stock and turning people out onto the street. It's a real can of worms. In terms of new construction, what I have been told by structural engineers is that typically the change from seismic zone two that we're in now to seismic zone three may cost as rarely more than 5% and oftentimes as little or one, as one or 2% of the cost of the entire project. And to give you a concrete example of that, the new state office building that's being constructed on the other side of the river um, was, uh, had its design changed to accommodate this new earthquake information at a very late, late stage as a result of input from our department. They went from a zone two design to a zone three design. They made that decision after the, the uh, excavation had been done and when the pilings were already being driven. Very, very late in the stage, very expensive to change anything when you're actually out there digging and pounding. The cost, after everything was done, of making that change from zone two to zone three and greatly enhancing the safety of that building was 1.3% of the entire project. Now for a state structure, they got to have 1% for art anyhow. So 1.3% for life safety seems to be a fairly, uh, fairly reasonable trade-off. The situation that we're in right now is, and the policy of our department, is that the earthquake risk is sufficient that all new construction uh, above well, all new construction should conform to the next higher earthquake zone, and we're trying to move a change in the earthquake zonation through the building codes. We also feel that for critical structures and high occupancy structures and hazardous facilities, which typically are not designed in accordance with the uniform building codes, that's the uniform building code is a, is, a, is a floor for that kind of design, not a ceiling. Those structures should have a rigorous site-specific earthquake hazard assessment done before they are designed and built. And we have in fact sponsored legislation uh, in the current session that would require that for buildings above a certain threshold or of a certain degree of criticality or hazardousness uh, that it would be necessary to go out and look at the site and actually calculate and predict what would happen at that site in the event of a given earthquake, in this case we hope a subduction zone earthquake, and then design the building in order to honor that design. Because the uniform building codes are uh, very crude in their approach to sites and they provide very generic answers. And what we're saying is that for the buildings we really care about, we really ought to do a good job of designing them up front. And what we're going to find in many cases is that doing that kind of upfront design allows us to be very cost effective in producing a resistant building as opposed to sort of applying a blanket approach. So if we can start with that, and if we can start now picking the most critical facilities, the ones that we really want to have functioning after an earthquake, like hospitals like power and water delivery systems, communication, fire stations, this sort of thing. If we start fixing those now, 1 50th of the problem per year for the next 50 years, we can be fairly sure that by the time the earthquake rolls around, if our probabilities are correct, that we will have a greatly enhanced resistance to this earthquake. And if we do it in little bits and pieces, if we spread it out over a generation or two, it's not going to cost us an arm and a leg. So that's what I'd like to leave you with today.
there's a big problem on the horizon. We're not ready to deal with it, but we can be prepared when it happens if we start now, make some simple changes in how we go about building things, and take the problem a little bit at a time and work at it slowly. If we wait 40 years to start this pro pro program, we aren't going to be ready, and it's going to cost us an arm and a leg. The time to start is now. And with that, I'll take your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Maiden. I don't think you lived up to your uh, name of Dr. Doom. I think it was Dr. Information. Um, the, uh, I, I should mention also, I don't know how many of you noticed that uh, Mr. Maiden delivered his entire address without notes, so he, he knows his material. <laughs> the privilege of the first question is that of Pamela Lesh, uh, board host today. Long-term preparations and structural changes are all fine, and that's somewhat reassuring thinking out over 50 years. But I'm sure what many people would like to know, me among them, is how much warning we're actually going to have. Could you talk a little bit about the state of scientific ability to predict the imminence of an earthquake and whether there are likely to be any improvements in that ability over this 50-year period? Okay. Um, I need to make a distinction between earthquake prediction and earthquake forecasting. Uh, earthquake prediction uh, means actually saying a date, a time, a place, a magnitude. That's kind of, that's the, uh, I understand now, the, the province of climatologists, which is uh, what Dr. <laughs> Ivan Browning is. And as you may remember, his last prediction came to naught. Earth scientists, at best, forecast earthquakes. In other words, we say that based on past history of a fault system, we can predict that there's a certain probability of an earthquake reoccurring in a certain time window. Uh, that's the kind of number that I gave you. Earthquake prediction actually means measuring some sort of physical changes in the earth that occur right before an earthquake. And there's uh, 10 or $20 million worth of hardware sitting on a portion of the San Andreas Fault in Southern California called the Park Field segment that has had an earthquake every 22 years regularly as clockwork for all of this century. So there's this huge amount of of recording information there because when the next one happens, they're going to catch all those precursors. Well, it was supposed to have happened in the middle of 1988. That was the, uh, the high confidence probability uh, time. And uh, it hasn't happened yet, so they're still sort of sitting there waiting for it to happen. And meanwhile, all the earthquakes are happening on other faults uh, over in the uh, Santa Cruz Mountains where they don't have any instruments. So earthquake prediction is kind of difficult because you have to have you have to see one happen in a place where you have instruments to collect enough information. And then you've got to go out and put all those instruments all over the other ones. It's possible that in 50 years we will have better ways to predict earthquakes. But you have to remember that our particular fault, uh, the easiest place to see it is under a mile and a half of water 50 miles offshore. It's going to be a difficult problem. <laughs> For the next question, I'll recognize Linda Ecker, member of the Law and Public Safety Standing Committee. You talked a bit about how improving the buildings as we go along will be cost effective and changes in the building code. Could you tell us something about how earthquake proof construction could improve or the economic position of the state as far as competitive with other states? Sure. Um, there is some concern that having to spend more money on buildings will make us less competitive. And I would simply point out that Tokyo, San Francisco, and Los Angeles all spend a lot more per building to make their buildings earthquake proof than we do or we would have to. And none of them seem to be suffering much in the long run from a lack of economic competitiveness. I think where we are going to be hurt, and I've had actually calls related to this, is when a Japanese firm calls up and they want to put a semiconductor plant in this area. And they're no fools. They see Mount Hood. They see ah, Mount Fuji. Uh, they think, well, you guys have a subduction zone like us, right? And it's like, yeah, we have a subduction zone. And then they say, have you prepared for an earthquake? And the answer is no. That's where we're going to hurt in terms of competitiveness because in that case, they'll go to San Francisco because even though they know they're going to have an earthquake in San Francisco, they also know from experience from the last earthquake that the water and power are going to be back up in a day. The state that we're in right now, the water and power may not be back up for a month or two months, mm -hmm. and that's, they don't, they don't want to deal with that kind of an economic impact. So the biggest impact on competitiveness is lack of preparation, because people coming here aren't, are, are aware of the problem. Harold Waite, City Club member. I've got uh, a request and a question. The request is, 
if an earthquake of the magnitude that you were describing were to happen right now, what would we see happening to the buildings out here to the north and west of where we're sitting? And then my question is, uh, if there's a potential of a magnitude 9, why shouldn't we go to uh, preparedness level 4B, I think it was that you called it, rather than 3? Okay. Um, if we had a major subduction zone earthquake right now, uh, I suspect that without naming individual buildings that uh, several of the buildings that we could see out of this window would suffer extensive damage and probably at least one of them would collapse completely. Uh, the uh, Many of the newer buildings probably would only be economic write-offs. They would not collapse and kill all their occupants. Uh, in terms of building codes, the highest level is zone four. That gives a good degree of resistance for typical California earthquakes, which are sharp and short. Subduction zone earthquakes are very different. The ground motion is not as sharp, and most importantly, and I didn't bring this up before, but I should, the Loma Prieta earthquake in San Francisco, ground shook for something like 10 to 15 seconds very strongly. The Alaska earthquake in 1964, the ground shook for four to five minutes. This is a characteristic of subduction zone earthquake that really worries engineers. It's very hard to build a building to rock and roll for several minutes. So if we go to zone four, we may be adding a lot of cost without improving the resistance of the building any. There's a big change between zone two and zone three in the flexibility of the building. And that flexibility is the single best uh, uh, guard against that long duration of shaking. So we think that zone three is the most cost-effective change to make. We may need to invent a zone five for Oregon and Washington that addresses that problem of long-term shaking. Uh, Brian Peterson, City Club member. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, this new information has been available since ab about 1985. And I was wondering, uh, since there has been a significant uh, amount of building downtown in the last few years, uh, even though the codes may not require it at the present time, have any of the new buildings taken new information into account uh, during the construction process? Well, I don't see every, uh, every report for every building that comes through town, but my understanding of talking to people at the Bureau of Buildings is that, yes, some buildings are being built to higher uh, levels of, of uh, seismic resistance. Uh, the state has also adopted a policy of all new construction being built to seismic zone three. So people are doing it without being forced to do it because they are seeing the handwriting on the wall. And we don't really want to force anybody to do it. We want to convince them that it's a sensible thing. P.T. Corsi, member. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, floodplain, the Columbia Willamette floodplain was uh, in particular danger. Uh, could you briefly discuss uh, other areas of Portland that might be not at such high risk? Okay. <laughs> That's an easier question to answer than which are at high risk. Uh, and one thing we have to make clear, that uh, when we talk about soils that are going to produce higher levels of damage, we're talking about tendencies. It's sort of like heart disease. We know that if you are overweight and eat lots of chocolate and smoke and all those other kind of things, you are more likely to have an er uh, a heart attack. But it doesn't mean that you're going to have a heart attack, and some people that do that live forever. Same thing with ground motion. Certain ground conditions are more likely to sustain severe damage. The best place, best places to be are on the gravel soils of East Portland, uh, extending from about, well, the entire peninsula area out to St. John's, and then from about Mount Tabor East is, is really the very best place to be. Uh, the Portland Hills may not be too bad, but they're, they're on a real case there. There'll be real bad areas in the Portland Hills, and there'll be real good areas. It's, it's harder to, to make a blanket assessment of that uh, area. Everything else is, is either bad or very bad. <laughs> I'm Ray Polani, a city club member. Uh, Mr. Magdian, uh, the, uh, the BART, the Bay Area Rapid Transit System in San Francisco, is in a tunnel under the bay, and it performed much, much better in the last earthquake uh, in comparison to the freeways and the Bay Bridge. Uh, we are in the process of uh, making a decision on the west side like rail, either on a surface in the canyon or under in a tunnel. Uh, do you have any feelings uh, of which one might be better? Okay. Um, understanding that I'm not an engineer uh, and that I'm a little bit outside of my area of specialty, uh, ground motions from earthquakes are typically far less 
below the surface in solid rock than they are on the ground surface. The ground surface tends to amplify them. And a tunnel would therefore experience much smaller amounts of ground motion and would not be susceptible to earthquake-induced landslides, which is a major problem. Large earthquakes produce, uh, trigger landslides on, on slopes that were stable under normal conditions. So uh, under those terms, it might be uh, easier to earthquake-proof a tunnel than a surface alignment. Dave Olson. Dave Olson, member. There is some risk of earthquakes on the Snake River, Hell's Canyon area, where Idaho Power has those dams. What do you think would happen if one of those dams, upper dams, went out to all the dams down below, and finally, Portland? Well, again, uh, it's a little outside my area of expertise uh, in terms of uh, dam failures, but uh, actually I was a commercial river guide for a decade before I started doing this, so I'm quite familiar with the Snake River Canyon. Uh, and I suspect that uh, the failure of some of the upper reservoirs might very well cause uh, Hell's Canyon Dam to overtop and, uh, and fail. Um, what kind of a flood that would look like down here, I don't know. Um, I have heard through the grapevine that uh, the Corps of Engineers assessed the effects of a failure of Bonneville Dam uh, in an earthquake and concluded that the levees along the, uh, the river in, in Portland would be sufficient to contain that flood. Uh, but it really, you know, you're talking a real speculative scenario and it would be very expensive to answer that question with any degree of certainty. Uh, Mr. Maiden, there's one uh, building in Oregon which is more important than the others because it could destroy the state. And uh, I'd ask what the earthquake magnitude and duration was contemplated for the Trojan plant when it was designed. And have you seen enough to persuade yourself that the earthquake risk at Trojan has, uh, is adequately understood? Well, yeah, um, that's, uh, there's no question that uh, Trojan is on the top of anyone's list of critical structures. Uh, I also suspect that it is the most earthquake resistant building in the state. That's not to say that it is completely uh, sufficiently resistant for a subduction zone earthquake. Uh, my department is not involved in the review of Trojan siting or design uh, uh, aspects, and we do see some of it. Uh, we do comment from time to time on it. Uh, but the, the question of what kind of ground motion a subduction zone earthquake can deliver to Trojan and what effects that would have on the plant are, are not at all, they're not real straightforward questions. And in fact, they're, it's sort of a moving target because we keep moving the earthquake around on them and changing the magnitude. So uh, as far as I know, uh, there's not been a definitive study uh, as, as to the resistance of the plant to a very large subduction zone earthquake. There have been some studies that I've seen, but I've I'm just not privy to all the information and, and, and don't know whether I've seen everything. I'm Larry Snell, I'm a member. And uh, during the 60s and 70s and early 80s, I was involved in a major project in California for earthquake preparedness. One of the things we came across in both uh, LA and San Francisco was that the buildings that were built to current modern high-rise seismic standards, when we actually hired uh, high-level seismic engineering specialists, they found that virtually, let's say, fewer than 25% of those buildings were actually constructed to the codes, that there was a huge gap between the design, which did meet the codes, and what was actually delivered. And when we talked to the actual people in charge of designing a number of those uh, high-rise buildings, the answer was, we know how to do it. But the minute we turn it over to the construction people and the owners, their overriding interest is how do we save money? So it leads to some interesting dilemma. I wonder if you people are looking at that aspect, even though it's not in your, in your ballpark. Uh, this is uh, something that is definitely of concern to structural engineers that are worried about uh, earthquake resistance. Uh, Roger McGarrigal, who is a local structural engineer who's also the chairman of the State Seismic Safety Policy Advisory Commission, this is one of the things that he harps on all the time. There's as designed and there's as built. Earthquake resistance in modern structure largely comes not from more steel or concrete, but by the way you connect those pieces of steel and concrete together. It's called detailing. It's the most time-consuming part of building a new building, and it's the place where people are most likely to cut corners. So uh, there is 
a real problem that many buildings may not be designed, be constructed the way that they were designed. But uh, it's a real expensive process to go back and look at them. And in any analysis of the resistance of any building, that's something that you have to take into account. Uh, Steve Pinnell, City Club member. Uh, could you say something about the, the need for and the cost of what could be done to retrofit uh, existing life support systems like the hospitals and fire and police stations and water and power? Well, I can't give you any, any numbers that are based on any you know, real hard facts. Um, I can tell you it will be expensive. Uh, I can, and I can tell you that you can't answer the question of how expensive it is until we have done, made the first step. And the first step is what we call a vulnerability analysis just to go around and look at every one of the facilities in question, look at the kind of construction, look at the site that it's sitting on, and make up a list of those that are greatly at risk, less at risk, and, and not particularly at risk. And then, th then go in and start uh, actually looking at the cost to fix the worst class of buildings. Uh, in order to assess any particular building's uh, uh, degree of resistance and to design a repair for it is not a trivial matter. It would require many man months of several professionals. Uh, you know, it's probably a ten to fifty thousand dollars question or a uh, process just to answer the question of what needs to be done and how bad off is it. Uh, and that's why I say it has to be. We have to really target the worst things first and the most important things first and take it a little bit at a time. Uh, you know, we're certainly looking at the, the total bill for all the critical structures is certainly in the billions of dollars over the next several decades. Uh, we may simply have to choose not to bring everything up to snuff and only deal with the most important structures. Thanks. <clears throat> it may be crass to think of economics in the middle of a disaster of this potential magnitude, but uh, has anybody looked at the question of how earthquake-proof are the banks? the places where the brokerage firms keep the records of everybody who invests, and to what extent, if you're in a hazardous area, uh, earthquake area, do uh, municipal bond uh, rating agencies take those hazards into account? Well, uh, an answer to the last part of the question first is that after we get through today, the, uh, they may take uh, that uh, into account uh, quite a bit more than they did in the past. Uh, it takes a while for this stuff to filter through. Uh, the, the question of uh, you know, financial institutions and their resistance and how do we get money to, you know, to buy what we need to fix things afterwards, that's a very important one. Uh, in California, big banks typically, all the important records are you know, sent by a special courier to another city every night and they, or they're taken home by executives every night and they have a very, a very, they've set up a system in order to protect that critical information. Uh, at the risk of putting in a plug for any particular institution, um, the uh, U.S. Bank Corp has is designing a or constructing or may have finished constructing a new computer northwest regional computer facility here in in Oregon and they have taken great pains to make it earthquake proof I believe they designed designed it to seismic zone four and they actually consulted me on a, on a site appropriate site before they built it so some institutions are paying attention to it in, in terms of the uh, you know the, the other big economic impact that we have to remember is that if there is widespread destruction of property, which is not insured because most property in Oregon doesn't have earthquake insurance, uh, banks are going to be left holding the bag on a lot of property that actually has to have money spent on it before you can even start rebuilding, and that's a major concern. Would single-family houses be more or less likely to be damaged by a subduction zone earthquake than would the commercial big office buildings that you've been talking about? Single-family dwellings are inherently uh, wood construction are inherently more resistant to all earthquakes uh, because the wood provides a great deal of flexibility and and they're generally very very much over designed uh, the greatest weakness for single-family dwellings is uh, their attachment to their foundation it doesn't matter how strong the house is if it's not firmly attached to the foundation it simply gets thrown two or three feet off the foundation and it may be a total write-off the single cheapest thing one can do to earthquake proof your home is to make sure that it's bolted to the foundation uh, older types of construction uh, brick and, su and such uh, tend to perform very poorly. I have uh, one last question, Mr. Maiden. A few months ago, a meteorologist Reed Bryson addressed City Club and gave a very good, what he called, second opinion on global warming, basically to the effect that it wasn't as bad as some of the people had made out. You have made a pretty strong case for the big earthquake being inevitable, but I'd like to put you on the spot and ask if you could give what some of the better arguments are against the position you're taking. That's a fair question. Uh, 
Um, first, uh, the fact that we are unable to record earthquakes of any magnitude on the subduction interface. Uh, every other subduction zone around the world makes some noise that we can record. Uh, part of this may be due to the poor uh, instrumentation that we have in the state of Oregon, which is being addressed right now by the uh, University of Oregon, which is installing a very sensitive seismic net. And in fact, I just spoke with the uh, a researcher at Oregon State University today who said that he is starting to pick up magnitude one earthquakes that are not being recorded by anyone else. So we may resolve that problem. Uh, the other real problem revolves around, it's a little arcane, but the rocks in the subduction zone have to be hard and brittle in order to break and produce an earthquake. And there is a fair amount of evidence, in fact some of which I just learned about yesterday, uh, that suggests that the rocks off the coast of Oregon may be unusually hot. And very hot rocks don't break, they just kind of ooze. Uh, so this raises the possibility that uh, at one extreme end, all the rocks may be hot enough that they ooze all the time. Uh, we think this is probably fairly unlikely. Uh, but it also raises the possibility that the, the amount or the width of that fault zone that is capable of breaking brittily and producing an earthquake may be much narrower than we thought. We've been assuming that it was perhaps 60 or 70 miles wide and hundreds of miles long. It may only be 10 or 15 miles wide and hundreds of miles long, which would greatly reduce the magnitude of the earthquake that we're facing. So we don't have all the answers yet, and things are changing, but unfortunately they're always headed in the wrong direction. I neglected... Uh in the opening to mention that next Friday, March 22nd, we'll be meeting here at the Hilton again, and the topic will be a panel discussion on the subject of throwaway girls giving birth to social dysfunction. Quite a change of pace from today, but also a, a timely uh, subject. As we adjourn today, let us give a uh, round of applause to thank Mr. Maiden for his very good presentation. <laughs>